Hello, thank you for joining me. And a big shout out to Adgear and to Samuel and Francis and Whale for putting this all together. Um, hopefully my computer will connect. Doesn't look promising. Uh, so I'm Sandy McGuire. I'm what you might call an independent researcher. Um, I used to work in San Francisco and sort of hated it, so I quit, and now I do full-time FP research. I, I live in Ottawa, and uh, it's fantastic how big of a FP community you guys have here. I just like, fantastic, and I plan to come to more of this because it's, it's fantastic. Um, so today I want to talk to you about free monads, which um, are a technique for writing code that I, I find is more maintainable, more comprehensible, um, and we're going to look at sort of what, what it is, how it works, some traditional problems with it, and then the solution to those problems. And is this legible to everyone? Yep. Fantastic. Uh, so this is me. Um, it says that there's slides on, available online, which there will be, and I forgot to upload. Um, <laughs> but this is my website here, and uh, I sort of talk a lot about uh, interesting FP things. So if you want to check that out, I'd strongly recommend it. Um, so I want to talk to you about my my last job, which uh, was a, it was a Haskell company in the Bay, and the code base was written by a bunch of contractors sort of beforehand in order to test out the idea. They wrote it in Haskell, but it was clear that they weren't really Haskell developers. Uh, there was this like big ball of I/O spaghetti where just sort of anything that needed to do I/O would do it immediately, and there was really no separation of concerns. The problem was that this this quickly became impossible to test because it was a microservice architecture. And so in order to run tests, you need to spin up like 20 different servers. You needed a database. You needed a Redis server. You needed a stat server. And you needed to wire all these things together. And it was so hard that nobody did it, right? Uh, oops. Um, and this, this was actually a huge problem. Um, our strategy for testing it wasn't. And so instead, we just did code reviews. This sort of worked, and you know, code reviews are better than nothing. But eventually, we, we, we had a bug that slipped through code review. And it was some stupid sort of state manipulating some other state. Uh, and it resulted in us uh, essentially printing money for our customers. And we lost a few million dollars because of it, which is a huge amount of money for a startup. <laughs> um, and so it's not just sort of aesthetically pleasing to write nice code that you know, is easy to understand and hard to write bugs. It actually like can save people's money and jobs and like have you know it's a good it's a good experience. Um, so that's sort of the motivation for me. Um, it seemed to me like this was this was a preventable situation, right? And partly it was don't write all your code in I/O, and I think that's a lot. I, most of us are functional programmers, um, but it's also sort of clear that most of our code bases are are actually. If you need to describe a service to someone, usually you can describe it in a few sentences. right? At a high level, all the code we write is usually quite simple. And the details um, is, is the nitty gritty details that cause most of the problems. right? It's like, what if, you, what if your database connection doesn't go up? Or like, what if you fail to push something? Or like, how do you do service discovery? It's, it's not really part of the problem. Um, it's just sort of things that you need to do in order to solve the actual problem. Uh, so free monads are what I think programming is going to look like in 30 years. It seems like we're usually, the FP community is about 30 years ahead of the mainstream community, which is frustrating now, but it's going to be awesome in the future. <laughs> um, and so the idea is this. You write your applications in a domain-specific language, and it's really easy to write this domain-specific language. This, this language is like very applicable for your problem at hand. Um, and usually, if you can do this, your problem turns into like 10 lines of code. right? Uh, because you just say, I've got exactly the primitives I need, and I'll express my problem in terms of that. Um, so once you've expressed this problem, you still actually need to run real code. Um, but what you do instead is you run a series of like what I consider compiler passes. So you've got this really high-level language, and you run compiler passes to make it from a high-level language to a slightly less high-level language, and slightly lower again. Um, and eventually, it does turn just all into I.O. Um, but you've sort of put all your implementation details in sort of these transformations. And in doing so, you can actually turn all of your implementation details into library code. And I think that's sort of the, the, the goal. Uh, 
is also this is where most of the bugs are, right? And so as long as your, your library code is, if you solve it one time in the library code, it's, it's a lot easier than sort of in each place you need to write the same implementation details, but they're not exactly abstractable. So I think free monads are a good solution to that. So uh, as a real example, at my last company, I wrote a data ingestion service that was gonna uh, read encrypted CSV files uh, off over FTP, and it's gonna stream them to a, an HTTP streaming service um, in batches, and then it's gonna record the statistics in Redis. And so I wanted to show you what that program looks like with this technique, which is this, right? It's five lines long and five lines of type, uh, type signature. Uh, and clearly, like, this thing doesn't actually run the code, but it's a good description of take the input, stream it somewhere, and then record a statement, right? At, at the very high level, to like the business people, this is all the code does. And so it's sort of nice that we can express the idea like this. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about all sort of all of these, um, all of what's going on here. The interesting part is the member constraints. And these things just say, I have some capability that can input a record. And I also have some capability that can output a record. And I can have a capability that outputs a stat. So inputting and outputting records, that's reading my data and pushing it somewhere and then recording the stats. Um, and so I want to just sort of walk through how this, this runs, and then we'll talk about how all of this is implemented and what it buys for us. So we can write a main program. This is going to run an I.O. eventually. Uh, so we've got this program. But to begin with, we have a set of open capabilities, and these describe uh, our like, domain-specific language. So we've got input, output, and output. We then write a, a function called CSV input, which just says, I want to pull a, my, my input for my records out of a file. And it's going to read each line in the file, and it's going to parse them as CSV, and then construct a record and provide my input. So you'll notice here it says, I've got an input of record as my open effect, and now I have a file provider as an open effect. So I've sort of implemented my input in, in terms of something slightly less high level. Now it's a file that I need. The next step is I want to actually decrypt this file. And so I uh, then call the decrypt file provider function which doesn't actually handle my file provider, but what it does is it steals that call and it wraps it with the decrypt uh, method, handled by some abstract encryption capability. I can then um, say I want to run, oops, I want to run my, my file provider over uh, FTP. So I've re replaced my file provider now with FTP provider, right? Likewise, I say, oh, I want to batch my records when I stream them out because it's cheaper for me to send uh, a one single API call of 500 records rather than 500 uh, API calls of a single record. Um, and from there, I want to say, oh, actually, I want to post these things over HTTP. And so I've replaced my output with an HTTP effect. You sort of see how each step of the way, I'm slowly building, I'm getting lower and lower level uh, and closer to the, the actual code I want. After this, I want to say, oh, I want to run my statistics in Redis. So I'm just going to update statistics in Redis and just push them here. I can then run my encryption by presumably doing something just in directly in I.O. Same thing in HTTP, FTP, run Redis. And then finally, I can run it. I've handled all my capabilities, so I don't need to handle any more. And I can just say, go, run this all in I.O. So that's sort of at the high level what this looks like. The nice thing about this is that each one of these can just exist in a library somewhere, right? No longer do you need to say, oh, I want to manually turn all these things into database queries. I no need to, like, manually uh, run the CSV. So I just write this really high-level program. Sam? Uh, in your Bayhack presentation of Primonads, IO was part of this list of effects, but I noticed that it's not part of the list now. Is it treated specially? Uh, so the question is, is IO treated specially here? Um, and it's not. This run M thing says, I have an IO effect that's lifted into this, this handler. And now I just want to run it immediately into that. Uh, so that sort of works for any monad. It doesn't have to be all in I.O., which we'll see actually in a second. Does that answer your question? Can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. This curly bracket is empty. It does not have uh, I.O. Yes. That's maybe the previous <coughs> slides. There is a back to I.O. effects. So <laughs> I'm okay. So now good. my question is answered. OK, good. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Um, so that's great. And presumably, that'll run a real server if we write all that code. Uh, but we also probably want to be able to test it without spinning up 20 servers and without actually pushing, pushing to HTTP. 
So instead, we can just say, oh, I want to run it purely, and I'm going to want to run it with these two records, which will correspond to every time I call get input, it's going to provide me with that record. And then I'm going to run the output and run the output for the records and stats. That should say record and not record. Um, and you'll notice that the return type here is now a list of all the stats I've returned and a list of all the records I returned. And so it's the exact same monadic code, except now I've, I've completely mocked everything out just by changing the functions that run to, to handle this. The, what's, what's really interesting here is that if the test and the interpreter, if all your interpreter codes are correct, and your program is correct under the test, then your program is actually correct under the real interpreter because the, the, the correctness composes. As long as each step of the way is correct, then uh, the, the correctness goes through in a way that is not really true if you just are explicitly mocking out individual pieces. So as, oh. Can you expand on that? Why is it not true if for mocking out? <clears throat> Uh, it's, it's not true sort of because you have all these implementation details scattered around and you need to make sure that you've correctly stubbed out all of them in all the places with the same sort of technique. And so it's probably true that you can do this, but I would argue this is significantly easier. As free monads exist today in Haskell, there's sort of two major players that I, I want to point out. One of them is called free or simple, and it's got no boilerplate. It's really friendly to use, but it's really slow. Um, and it's incapable of expressing a lot of things which we'll point out later. These last two points are, are a huge problem in terms of actual adoption, because I think this is a fantastic technique, but it turns out like the community at large is quite hesitant to say, we're going to take on something that's 35 times slower than just writing in the IO, right? And uh, they say, oh, we want to be able to handle resources. What happens if like an exception is thrown? We also want to like call our cleanup code. And unfortunately, Free or Simple is unable to, to deal with that. The other um, major player is called Fused Effects, which has extremely huge amounts of boilerplate. Things that are like six lines in Free or Simple are like 150 lines in Free or Simple. <laughs> um, but that being said, uh, it, it is as fast as possible. It, it runs exactly as fast as you would do it if you wrote all this code by hand directly in I.O. And it lets us uh, capture all of the, the resource and the, like, the exception handling stuff that we'd want to. So these are both not great trade-offs, right? Either you can have slow and inexpressive or a huge amount of work. And the way I look at it is if something is too much work, people won't use it. But if it, an ex if it can't express the problems you want, then people also won't use it. So this was sort of the, the frustration I found myself in roughly two months ago, and I figured there's probably a, a problem, and it's sort of consumed my life since then. So I have a new library called Polysemy, and it sort of solves all the problems at the same time. It's got no boilerplate, it's really fast, and you can express everything. And so today I want to talk about um, sort of the naive expression of free monads, how free or simple, and how uh, fused effects solve that, and then how I was capable of merging these together. Hi, yeah. Um, was comp compile time speed also something you optimized for? Compile time speed was not something I optimized for. For error messages during compilation? Uh, error messages um, are actually really good in Free or Simple and in my library. And so if you forget to handle something, it'll say, oh, you forgot to handle it, rather than just pages and pages of type errors. Um, so I want to talk about, we're going to use the, the hackneyed example of a teletype. I'm not entirely sure why this is what we use, but this is what we use as the example. Um, so we, we're just going to describe interacting with a console. We can say we can read lines and we can write lines. So if you read lines, it's essentially just receive input, right? And if you write line, it outputs something. I want to just like show you that this thing is really and truly just a data structure, right? We we have a we want to if we want to write an echo server, we say we have an echo. Uh, which is going to read a line, it's going to give us back this message variable, and then we'll write that message variable, and then we're finished. Nothing exciting here, right? Um, and that thing is described with this data type here. We have three constructors, the done, write line, and read line. Because write line doesn't um, do any, it doesn't return anything to us, we don't have anything in our continuation here. But read line does return a string, and so you can, you can bind on that string and then use that pr to produce something. Uh, and this thing is a, is a monad, it turns out, right? 
we've got binding, which is sort of just go as deep into the data structure as you can and replace the done there with, with the next action. And then return is just done. So this thing it really and truly is a monad, uh, which means we can write that program a little more idiomatically. We can say, bind the message from read and then write it. There's a little noise here from the done, uh, but it's, it's cleanupable. Um, but this, this, is, this is interesting, right? Because really and truly, we just built the data structure that exists in memory. There's no evaluation semantics here. Um, but it sort of looks like a program, right? We, we're, we're using all of our traditional sort of imperative flow in order to build this thing. But we can define um, evaluation semantics for it. So we can transform a teletype into IO by if we have done, we just return that in IO. If we have a write line, then we can call put sterlin and just push it to the console. And then we recursively call ourselves, which is going to handle the next step in our big nested data structure. And likewise, for to read a line, we call get line and then pass the result of that down our continuation. The good thing, though, is we can also run this thing purely. And so we can, we can take a list of strings corresponding to the input that the user typed. Not actually, but that's if we want to test this thing, we would say, here's what they type. And then we're going to also return the strings that were emitted. So in order to do this purely, if done returns nothing, right? Um, if we write a line, then we're just going to append it, or I guess prepend it, to the result of the recursion. Um, if we had no more messages that the user typed in, we just return an empty line. The semantics here, you know, you can decide what they should be, but I just chose an empty line. And then um, if we do have something, if we do have a line, we will just feed it to the continuation. So here we have two different um, interpretations of the exact same code, right? We can run it purely or we can run it in IO. And that's um, sort of the theme of what we're going to build. You'll notice that the done constructor and this recursion are not all that useful. They sort of exist only in order to make this thing a monad, right? Um, and so we can, we can factor those things out. So the top is what this used to be. And afterwards, we pull out the recursion and we pull the done. And we just parameterize this free structure over some functor f. Uh, the recursion is now in this impure thing. And the done is now this pure, which means now teletype sort of looks a little less noisy, right? It doesn't have the recursion anymore, and it doesn't have this, this done thing. So here, teletype is a functor, and free is a monad whenever uh, f is a functor. Again, the, these details don't matter too much, just it's enough to know that these things are not necessarily how they work. Um, so we can write a few helper functions, which are just going to wrangle um, our, our construction into the right shape. Right? So we can take a right line and then sort of replace the, the, the continuation with pure, which does nothing, and then bind this thing in impure. And this thing gives us now an action in free teletype. It sort of just turns this constructor into an action in our monad here, right? So echo now looks sort of exactly like an I.O. program. You can't really tell that it's doing anything funky here. And if, if you didn't see a type signature on this, you'd say, this thing is just reading and writing to a console, right? So we, we've sort of hid away all the implementation details. And now this looks exactly like it should. Um, we also needed to do this sort of recursive thing to evaluate it, right? We'd say, check on the done, and great. Otherwise, sort of call yourself. And again, we can, we can factor that out. And so we're sort of pulling out the necessary machinery from that construction into this free experience. All of a sudden, we've got less boilerplate. We can write the same evaluate in I.O. by sort of just saying run free, doing a pattern match on our constructor, and then calling the necessary get lines or put lines. And this is, this is great, right? Um, but sort of eventually you say, what if I don't want to write a bespoke effect every time I want to do multiple things, right? I don't want to make um, do IO with X and then do IO with Y as separate types. So I want to be able to combine these things somehow. So I've also created a data type here corresponding to a bell. I don't know what the semantics are. Maybe it rings something. Maybe it flashes. It doesn't really matter. All this, is again, is just purely syntactic. Uh, but I can make a sum functor. And the sum functor takes a functor f and a functor g. And, and then it's sort of it's either the left one or the right one. And since those things are both functors, sum itself is a functor whenever both f and g are a functor. Uh, so this is just a way of building a functor out of two separate functors. And because I have that, I can now make a new type, which is sort of 
just putting my two effects together, right? I've got my, my teletype effect, and I've got my bellif type, and by summing them together, now I have a functor of both things. Because free is polymorphic over any functor, then this is equivalent to having sort of bespoke effects. So the, the construction is very similar. The only difference now is I have an L or an R when I want to build these things. And this allows us to, as you'd expect, to interleave effects, right? We can say, I want to read a line from my teletype effect, and I want to ring the bell if the message is something with the bell effect. So we, we've now got sort of the ability to build little pieces of an DSL, and we have the ability now to combine them, right? Uh, we, we can build an algebra out of these things. If we can, if we can run it one functor and run the other functor, then we can run both of them, right? Sort of by just choosing which one are we and then using the correct interpretation. Um, and what this means is now, because sum is a functor, we can put it inside of a functor, and we can just build a tree of all the types we need. It's not restricted to two. We can put as many effects in here as we want. And so we can, we can actually generalize this. Rather than building this big tree, we say, I've got a union with capabilities R. And it's going to take this type level list of saying, my capabilities are bell, teletype, I've got some state, I can run errors in it. And um, just this is sort of the generalization of explicitly building this tree of sums. Um, and as long as every type inside of that thing is a functor, then union R is also a functor, for exactly the same reason that sum was a functor. We also can express the idea of membership inside of this, uh, this union. So we have this type uh, constraint saying, F is a member of R, right? And so in this case, we'll say bell is a member of this big union thing. We can say teletype is a member of this big union thing. But we wouldn't say that IO is, an, is a member of this, because IO doesn't appear in this type level list. And because we have this, this type class, we, we can put methods on it. And so we say something is a member of the union if we can get into the union. If we say we have some f and I want to construct a union out of that thing, right? that's just finding exactly how to encode it. And I can also project out of that thing. But I'm not guaranteed that that union contains the thing I'm asking for. right? The union is one of many, uh, but that doesn't mean it's any particular one. By doing this, we can sort of clean up again this, this right line function and all the other functions so that they, they now call inject. Right? The difference is this thing used to call L, which was writing the injection by hand, but now it's all type classed. Uh, by doing this, we're polymorphic in our capabilities. And so now you just say, I've got this big list of effects that I don't really care about the order of. I'll decide that later. And now I can just inject arbitrarily many things into this. And I can do that so long as I just add a new constraint. So this is sort of free monads more or less as they exist out in the wild. Um, the free or simple and fused effects take different branches from here. So I want to explore both and show you sort of how the trade-offs they made affect the end goal, and then eventually figure out how we can combine them back into a single strategy. So free or simple gets rid of the boilerplate of having to build this big functor, and uh, fused effects gets more speed and expressiveness at the cost of a lot more machinery. So because free or simple is simpler, we'll look at that one first. The thing about simple effects is you can't ever embed an, an action inside another action. And so I can't have an effect that will um, conditionally run some, uh, some effect and conditionally run a different one. It's sort of like do something or receive something. Those are more or less the only effects I can write. And because we can't embed them, it's sort of like we just have this big, big linked list or queue, right? We can put things on either end of it, but we don't need to build a tree structure. And so because of, instead of that, we can sort of, instead of writing this thing where we nest all those things, we can just write it sort of as a queue, right? And there's a little bit of magic to get the, the message to bind. Um, but it, it's not really relevant to us. And because we can do this, we don't actually need to have those functor things anymore because they don't need to contain any data. Now we just have a big list of all the things we want to run. So we used to have this type. And now we can write it as a, a GAT, a generalized algebraic data type where instead of having some actual member here, we can say, I'm just going to change the return type of myself. And so we're saying right line will generate a teletype of type unit um, after receiving a string as a parameter. Uh, 
read line doesn't take any parameters, but it returns a teletype of string. So these things look a lot uh, like what your eventual code would look like, right? These things are more or less, oops, I've gone, I've gone too far. These things are, they look exactly like they should in the eventual thing, and they also don't have functor instances. So usually when we want to be able to write our types like at the bottom instead of the top, uh, we use the Granada functor. Uh, but here you say that it's because they use this list of effects instead of the tree. I didn't quite get the. I didn't don't quite understand why this list allows us to use this style. Oh, um, so before we used to have this parameter a. And this thing was actually a piece of data inside our constructor. And that thing corresponds to the next computation I want to run afterwards. Um, but because those, thing, because those things will always form a, a linked list, then it, we don't actually need it to be here. We can express that, that list structure as a list rather than directly inside of our effects. Does that answer your question? Kind of. I feel like I need to take a closer look at the type link. OK. Um, so, the, the original sort of naive approach of the, the free monad where you have this, this deep uh, continuation, unfortunately, is asymptotically terrible. Because every time you bind, you need to go all the way through it to the very end. So that's big O of n, and then you need to put something. So to construct something of n size, that's big O of n squared. Um, if you can do that instead with a list, then all of a sudden now that's just big O of n, you just need to append. Right? That's great. But it's got really high constant factors because we've got this big uh, list of effects we're running. And so we need to allocate for that. And then we need to clean that up later. And so even though it's big O of n, which is great, it's like 35 times fat slower than, it, than just running IO. Um, so two months ago, I posted this on Reddit saying, free monads are great. I don't care that they're slow. They're great. You should use them anyway. And the community got mad at me, saying, we do care that it's slow. You're an idiot. Um, but Li Yao Zia, um, who's relatively well known in the community, said, I bet you could just use a final encoding and get all this for free. And he gave me this example here called run freer, this freer type. This thing, uh, what? <laughs> I have no idea, right? He, he just sent me this thing. And I sort of played around with it for a while. And it turned out it did, in fact, uh, it did, in fact, make everything faster. He sort of gave me this magical type, and I played around with it, and it did, in fact, give me 35x speed up. I had no idea why, until actually writing this talk is when I figured it out. Um, and so it turns out we have this, this interpretation function that we wrote earlier that's sort of given some natural transformation from our functor into the eventual monad. We can then sort of run at every step of the way this recursion transform each, each of our individual actions into the monad, and then produce the eventual result. And this, the existence of this thing is what makes this a free, uh, the free monad. Because we can construct any monad we'd like at the end of the day, uh, then there's some category stuff that I don't understand, but, uh, and I won't even pretend. <laughs> um, but we can, we can just sort of shuffle this definition around. right? We're going to move the free to the top. And we're going to replace that functor with our union um, and put a new type of constructor on it. And that, so that's sort of where this construction comes from, uh, is just sort of reshuffling the type that we want to run at the end of the day and then putting a new type constructor around it. And that thing is great. So who knows exactly where this stuff comes from originally. I have no idea why this works, but this does. Um, and so this improved my constant factors by 35x, meaning all of a sudden, this encoding was now free in a, in a different sense, right? All of a sudden, I had the zero cost abstraction for having a nice way of writing my effects um, without having to pay any runtime cost for it. And the question is why? Why does this work? Um, and we can, we can talk about reader t, which, uh, if you're unfamiliar, is a monad which has access to a piece of constant state. And whenever you want, you can ask for that state. Um, and then you can branch on it if you want. So usually people put things like environment in there or configuration or sort of things that aren't going to change throughout the life cycle of the program. So this is zero cost, right? Because it's just some piece of memory I have somewhere and I can just read that thing whenever I want. Um, 
so the, the function run reader t looks like this, and run freer looks like this. And the only difference here is that r is replaced with this, this for all x thing, right? And so it turns out that what we've written is just reader t in, in disguise. Um, and just to prove it, here are the, the monad instances. And uh, you'll notice that besides changing some variable names, these things are identical. I wish I had known this when I was originally writing this stuff, because it was a lot of work for me to plumb through all the actual typing and write these, these instances. Um, but yeah, so, so this is why this is free, is because we're, we're not actually doing anything. We just have some function that we call, and then that works. So um, because of that, we can say, I can turn any f of a into a freer of a, right? We used to have to write this bespoke thing where we call pure at some point. But now what we do is we just receive the eventual transformation into the eventual <coughs> monad. And then we call that thing after injecting f of a into the union. And this type checks, and this does what we want. Uh, but what this means is every time we call this function, we're actually just running our effect immediately in the eventual monad that that's going to be asked for. So we don't actually pay anything to do this. Right line looks a little cleaner, which is nice. Um, I just said this. So we can uh, so just to sort of trace through what the compiler is doing to sort of show you why that this thing is actually zero cost. Um, so I, again, I wrote this echo server, and I'm going to run it by running the teletype and I/O. We'll sort of trace through how this works. So I run freer of echo, and I can replace the definition of echo with its definition, um, and then also replace read line and write line with their definitions in terms of lift freer, which I can then replace with just the definition of that thing, right? So it's just receive the, the reader and then use it. Then the instance of bind for this thing is to just replace that everywhere. These things in line, and they say, it's just a pattern match now, right? Pattern match on my thing. It says, oh, OK, if it's a read line, do get line. Otherwise, do put str line. And Haskell is smart enough to realize this is all static. So it will just optimize those things away. It comments them out. It says, great, and it inlines. So all of a sudden, this, this, this just works. We, we don't pay anything for this, which is, which is great, because at the end of the day, really and truly, we are running the exact same I.O. code that we would have written by hand, except that we didn't have to write it by hand. It's so free. So that is, we can solve the boilerplate and the performance problems. And we're going to look now at sort of how fused effects works. Uh, so we need to rewind and sort of forget everything you, you learned in the last five minutes. Unfortunately, it's sort of, we've split time and we need to go back now. So just to rewind, this is what, we look, this is what it looked like before we left. So uh, we've got this free structure, which has all the free monadic stuff in it. We've got our own unit type, or our, our command types. And then we just call inject to construct the constructors. Here's the thing we'd like to be able to describe, but we can't. Uh, we'd like an error type, which can throw exceptions and catch exceptions, right? Throwing is easy. We just take some E and we throw it. Uh, but catching, we want to have some embedded computation, right? We want to say, try to run this program. And if it fails, then this should have, uh, yeah, then if it fails, then try to catch it with this. And then the result of either of those things is this. But this is too embedded. All of a sudden, our trick for sort of making a big list doesn't work anymore. This is sort of the effect we'd like, but it's not clear what to put in those question marks. You can maybe keep track of all of your effects and then say, I want a free over all those effects. But unfortunately, this thing doesn't work. This is too. The compiler yells at you. I don't know why. I think because R contains itself. And all of a sudden, there's paradoxes or who knows, right? This doesn't work. So instead, what we can do is we can just take a, a monad parameter. And we'll just say, we have some monad, which we'll put our things in. And then we sort of force that thing to be free of R. And we do that with lift R, which just says that M is always going to be free of R. Uh, that mean, they, they don't have to use the M if they don't want to. Uh, effects like state are really and truly just first order. They, they have a piece of some variable somewhere, which you can read or write. And that doesn't have any embedded computation. So they can just ignore m. Um, but we have a problem, right? Which is we have the state monad and we have the error monad. And we can embed state calls inside of the error. Uh, 
And there's sort of two semantics here between what we want. One of which is if you're um, handling an error and it throws an exception, then you still want to persist all of your state. That's, I guess, probably what most people would think of. But you also might want something like software transactional memory, where if, if, uh, if, an, effect, if an error is thrown, then in fact you want to re roll back all your state changes. And describing this is actually non-trivial. Turns out we can use a functor. And usually I think most of us think of functors as some sort of like container. But uh, I like to think of it as a value in some sort of context, right? If you have a functor of f of unit, then it has no value. It only has context. And if f is existential, then you know nothing about it other than you have some context that you're not allowed to touch, right? fmap isn't allowed to touch anything except the value, and so this context can never be changed. And so we can actually use this to wrap up the state of a world um, when we run an effect. If I have some state monad and it needs to preserve its, its current state while it goes into something, we just wrap that up into a, a functor and we can push that down the line. This thing turns into this terrifying type class here called effect. Uh, I didn't invent this. This comes from a paper called Effect Handlers in Scope. Um, but the idea is I have some sort of state token, TK. That thing is a functor. And I receive a, the state of the world for some other effect here. right? Um, and then I have some strategy for distributing that through a computation. And it changes my, my type internally. Um, this M might be I have some effect which has um, like the state capability. And afterwards, I don't have the state capability anymore. That's what these M and Ns are. I've sort of lost capabilities in this transformation. Uh, and this, I guess, describes these things. Um, in particular, uh, yes. So the effect describes how an effect can have state from someone else pushed through itself. So this means the effect instance for error will describe whether or not state preserves or um, loses its state transactionally. So we can write an instance of this. It's, I didn't really write this by hand. I just put in holes until the compiler told me what type it is. And I, I, like, I have no idea how this works, really. It's <laughs> uh, this ice cream cone operator sort of replaces the value inside of a functor. So if I have a functor of b, I can just stick an a inside of that thing by f mapping constant into it. Um, so again, like I didn't even try to understand this. I just wrote something that works, which is not a good sign in the library author, right? When you don't understand what's happening. Um, but this thing, this thing is sort of why fused effects works, and these things are how higher uh, order effects work. But this strikes me as a problem, right? If if it's too hard to think about um, how to actually write these things, then that's maybe not a, a, a something you should expose to the user. So you said that there are two different interactions there can be between error and state. Yeah. Is this instance that you don't know how it works the one that preserves or reverses the state? So I was hoping no one would ask that question. The question is, uh, <laughs> which, which semantics does this have? And this actually has both semantics, depending on uh, whether you run the state effect before or after the error. Um, so the way it un unravels will push the state differently through it. So. Thank you for asking, but I wish you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, state like obviously has a piece of state that it needs to thread through, and that thing is just the value of the state. And then we can, we can call weave to do that. Whoops, I think I've gone too far. So we don't need to care too much about exactly what's happening, except uh, we have this decompose function, um, which takes a union, and it says, Either that union contains this thing, or it doesn't contain that thing, right? And if it doesn't contain that thing, then it will never contain that thing. So we can, um, do I have a type on this thing? Oh, I do have a type. So, so the type is we, we have some, the head of the list of our, our capabilities. We pull that thing out, and maybe it's there, and maybe it isn't. So either we get a value of that type, or we don't ever have a value of that type. So just to, to walk through this, we can say, we can look at our, um, our effect. And is that thing a state, right? If it is a state, then we know how to handle it. But if it isn't a state, then we need to call some other interpreter in order to do this. 
So we pack up our current value of the state into some state token, right? This thing is a functor in, at, or in, in unit, which preserves some state that no one can ever touch. And we also write a distribution law, which says, if I have a pair of a state and a function to run, then I just run state with the new state that you've asked me to do. Uh, and I weave that through the other effect. So I've now pushed my statefulness through some other effect. And this assumes that I have a member of that here. Uh, so it's not super important to understand how this works. Like I, I read the paper probably 20 times, and it took me several hours to like sort of grok enough to do this. So then maybe this is a bad question, but so um, because decompose focuses on the head of the list, does that mean you need to be careful in what order you create the list of effects that you're dealing with? Um, it doesn't, in fact. So good question. The question is, um, do you need to be careful with which order you construct this list in? And the answer is, this list is always polymorphic until the very time that you're running your interpreters. The, the order of your interpreters determines the order of the list. And so it's just the functions like we looked at for calling main that, that describe the, the list. It's polymorphic up until then. Amazingly, all of this works. Uh, but it's slow. And it's slow not for any real reason other than the compiler has a hard time recurs, uh, inlining recursive functions. So sort of remember when we looked at it's a zero cost abstraction only because we can inline at every step of the way. Um, but we can, write, we, can, we can solve the problem, right? So I'll write a little inline fragment here which says I'd like to inline this. And GHC will say no, I'm not going to do that. And it's like okay. Um, so the, the solution is instead of calling run state, we call run state B. And then run state B is just equal to run state but it's got a no inline fragment. And this is enough to trick the compiler into to doing all the great optimizations that you'd really want. Um, the GHC guys have told me not to publicize this, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so remember, fused effects, it works, and it's fast, and it solves our problems, except it's got all this boilerplate. We need to write these effect instances, which are insane, and like no human, I think, can possibly understand how they work. Um, and that's, that's a problem. Unfortunately, they're, they're necessary in order to do higher order effects. And higher order effects are necessary if you want anyone to possibly use your library. So it seems like we're sort of at an impasse, right? Where um, do, uh, we need to have this boilerplate. But we don't, which is great news. Uh, so we wrote the free effect. <laughs> the talk gets weird from here, guys. Um, this thing looks a lot like the, the effect uh, type class where I have some existential functor, and I've got the thing I want to wrap, and then I've got some token, I've got my distribution function, and I've got this TKA to B thing. Um, this thing is, we don't care too much about. Uh, this is just to make everything a, a monad at the end of the day, which it isn't otherwise. Um, but this thing truly is a free effect because we can give an instance of effect for it given no constraints, right? The solution is we have two pieces of state that we want to put together. And we can do that by F mapping one of them inside of the other one. right? And then because the composition of any two functors is itself a functor, this thing is still a functor. And now it describes the state of both effects at the same time. Um, in order to distribute between them, we decompose them. We F map in to run one distributor functor. Then we come outside, we run the other distribution functor. Again, it doesn't super matter. I mostly wrote this, honestly, again, just with type holes. Um, but we can, we can now lift any effect directly into yo, which means we can get the effect instance for free. We do that by just using the identity functor. The identity functor. So it has no state right, to begin with. Again, amazingly, this works. We haven't really solved the problem. We've just delayed the problem. Now we've said the user doesn't need to write these effects. We will sort of hold on to them until later. There's a problem, which is that the type of run free doesn't allow us to change the return type. And if you think about the type of run state, it takes an initial state and it returns the, the final state. right? So it takes a free of A and turns it into a free of S and A. So that thing has changed the return type. But run free doesn't allow us to do that. right? We say we have some X, and we've got a natural transformation also into X. And then we can transform a free of A into an M of A, which is annoying. And it seems like maybe we can just put the functor here 
But unfortunately, this thing isn't a monad because all of a sudden you can't construct a TK of A given an A. So you can't write return for this thing. You can say maybe this thing is implicative, but then it turns out you can't bind. And so this thing is only a monad if TK is a monad, which uh, is pretty restricting in terms of describing context because now whenever you want to, to weave some effect, you need to write a monad instance for that thing, which is uh, annoying. But we're allowed to pick any monad when we evaluate these things, right? That's sort of the appeal of the free monad is we can always run it in any monad we like. Usually we just choose the user's eventual M. So if the user wants to run an IO, we just run it in IO. But we don't need to do that. In fact, we can run ours in state T of their monad and then just steal the instance of state transformations from there uh, in order to change ours. So this is sort of what it looks like now. Um, again, not super important, but the point here is now we're constructing a state T. So this entire block is constructing a state T at the end, and then we run that thing immediately. And so this thing changes the type even though we weren't really allowed to do that. Um, it's not super important to, to, to grok this because we're going to clean it up immediately, but it's also important to see we sort of put in these yo things. And now we need to like do some F mapping in order to make everything work out. Um, and it's, it's not super pleasant to work with, but we, we sort of solved all the individual sub goals. We've got performance now, we've got expressiveness, and because we can change the, the type of this thing, it means we can use our old solution for, for performance here. We've gotten rid of almost all the boilerplate because we don't need the functor instances, you don't need to write a monad instance, you don't need to, uh, really there's no instances you need to write, and you don't need to write any types. Everything is just functions at this point. But it's not lovely to use yet. <laughs> um, again, this, this yo thing, remember writing a, an effect instance was hard. And we haven't solved that. We've just pushed it until now you write an interpreter that needs to write the exact same code. And so we can clean up the mess of writing an effect handler with an effect handler effect. <laughs> uh, like I said, it, it gets weird. <laughs> so. This is sort of what the, the instance for effect for error looks like. And instead of this, what we do is this is eventually what the, the interpreter looks like, right? The, the, the interesting things here are run T and bind T. And these things are combinators that come from our effect handling monad, which are now capable of sort of writing the effect instance for you. Uh, besides that, we just try to run the error and we see if it works. So these come from an internal effect I call tactics, uh, which is defined like this. And it's crazy, and that's why this thing is internal. But we have some, some functor over which we want to thread through. We have the initial monad that we're evaluating from, because the idea of the free effect is that now we always need to evaluate from the initial um, monad that it was constructed with, and we don't know what that is anymore. So now this thing is existential, and we sort of keep track of it here. Um, but it turns out that this n is why it's hard to write effect instances by hand. We also have a new set of capabilities, and these capabilities are the ones we want to build. So you'll notice here I, the result of running the hoist interpretation is in itself an effect in free r. But this r is sort of different than the context in which the tactics is running. Um, so get initial state corresponds to that, that state we had. Hoist interpretation is the distribution law. Um, and we, we can write sort of this, this weird uh, sort of head of the, the capability list. So we have some capabilities R, and then we also have this tactics capability. And this tactics capability can produce things who's, who have also all of the effects in R and they also have the effect in E. So in order to handle an effect in E, this thing is sort of what makes everything everything lovely. We get these three combinators of it, pure T, run T, and bind T, which correspond to lifting a first order effect into a, a higher order effect. Run T will say, I have some internal computation, but it doesn't depend on anything. So I can just run it immediately with whatever state you gave me. Um, and I also have bind T, which is if I, for the example of the um, error handler, I need to be able to lift my, my computation over the error that I eventually received. So we've sort of pushed all of the, the nasty bits of writing it into an effect, right? 
and this is where we stop. It doesn't get weirder. Uh, we've solved everything, and we've now gotten rid of the pain of having to write these by hand. Uh, so I want to leave you with a comparison, just to start with, or to end with, sorry. Uh, and this is what bracket effect looks like in fused effects. If you're unfamiliar, bracket will do cleanup. So you can allocate a resource, and then if there's an exception thrown while you're using that resource, it calls the, the cleanup. This is like try finally. And if we look at it, oh, it doesn't fit on the slide. It's not a good sign, is it? Oh, can we? I don't know how to zoom out. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's not so good. <laughs> uh, is this back to normal? I don't know if it matters. So uh, my, in my library, the exact same thing fits comfortably, no problem. Uh, I'm defining it here. I've got some, some magic that will construct all the smart constructors. I call bind, run t, bind t, bind t, instead of having to write that effect instance. And then everything just works. So uh, shout outs to my girlfriend, Virginie, who put up with me talking about this stuff for like nine weeks in a row. She doesn't care at all about programming. So it was great of her to not have broken up with me. <laughs> uh, Leah Zia, who gave me the initial idea for the final encoding, who sort of made all this possible. Without those initial uh, performance improvements that I saw, I would have just stopped immediately. Uh, and Rob Ricks from the Fused Effects package for putting up with me talking so much crap about his great library uh, and for sitting down and sort of explaining to me why it worked. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. <laughs>